Thank you, praise team. I, man, you always bless my heart. Love everything that God does through you and pray that the Lord will just keep on doing it. And uh, man, you guys are something. And uh, they bless our lives, don't they? I tell you what, it's, uh, you know, music is, um, is, uh, has been used forever to really usher us in and present to us and get us prepared and and the Spirit moves through it, and the Holy Spirit speaks to us in, yeah. in the music. It's really just preaching to, to, to a rhythm, really, is all it is. It's, it's, not just, uh, it's not just something you do before the preacher gets up to preach. Uh, music, is, music is a vital part of worship and praise and adoration. You know, the Lord says, love me with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And, and the way we worship him with our heart is that our emotions are involved in it, you know? And I know so many people that are, that are fearful of that. It's like, you know, they're, that's a part of their life that they're, they're just, they're just, that would be the last thing to release out of their life, a little bit of emotion, you know? But, but, but God says, you know, when, when, you, when you fail to give me that part of you, you're giving about, about, about a quarter of what I've asked you to give me. And so I just encourage you, and I know you guys do it. I'm not trying to get on to anybody. I'm just encouraging you to just let the Lord speak to you and lead you and, and, and move to you and your heart with the music and all of those things. We've, we've been in a series. Uh, I, d- I didn't know it was going to be a series to start with, but when I started before Christmas with a, <laughs> with a couple of messages, I really, you know, I, I, I've just, there are a couple of big questions that, that I had uh, heard people ask many, many times, and I just really never had shared anything from the Word on it. And one of those is, um, why, do, why, do, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the righteous suffer? Uh, we know that if the, if the evil folks get their comeuppance, well, glory to God, there's finally justice in the universe. But what about good people? And these terrible things that many times happen to good people and good people get sick and good people die and good people have tragedies. And what is that all about? And why would God allow that? And then that kind of went on into um, how why doesn't God answer my prayer the next week? <laughs> and we finally determined that no is an answer, right? <laughs> okay, just, uh, just making sure about that. When he says no, sometimes he does say no. And sometimes he says yes, and that's our preferred answer. And we love that. No's very difficult to handle, but uh, wait is in the middle there, you know. Well, this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm working in, I'm doing. It may not be like you think it's going to be, and it's going to take some time, but, uh, but hang on, you know. One of my favorite slogans, grab a knot and hang on. Because it's coming, and that's, you know, that's, uh, that's something that we have to work through. Well, then Christmas came, and I was going to preach, uh, why did, would a man serve God for nothing? I remember about Job, and, and it deals with our motives. It de- really, it, it's not about suffering. It's about uh, commitment is what it's about. It's about why, why do I love God? Why do I pray? Why do I read my Bible? Why do I come to church? Why do I do the things I do? Is it because I love God, or do I have some ulterior motive in mind? Will a man, the, the, book, the question of the book of Job is, will a man serve God for nothing? That's what the devil asked God when he was talking about Job. Yeah, yeah, he serves you. That's because you bless him so much. I mean, who wouldn't serve God with a paycheck like that? He'd give him everything he wants. And it just dealt with those kind of things. And, and then we talked about the will of God and how to know the will of God. And then last week we had the boys in the furnace, and, and we and we looked at and we looked at uh, how how does how does God go about about changing us? What is it that would 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 usher us to change? And sadly, most of the time, it, it's it, some kind of a of a, a of an event or a, or or some kind of a a unit or a crisis or some kind of thing that happens in our life that all of a sudden pushes us to the point where, uh, man, we grow in the Lord and we get past that little small stuff that we, that we get stuck. Yeah, it just has to get our attention. Good, good word, Bill. Yeah, it just has to get our... And, and, and so we looked at that with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, this week, uh, one more, one more, maybe, maybe next week, seven silly questions, but, but I'm, I'm working on that. But, but, but anyway... Seven silly questions. 
in the book of Malachi. Malachi, there are seven questions in Malachi. Read it this week. That might be a little homework challenge for you. Read the book of Malachi, Malachi see if you can find the seven questions that, uh, that God asked Israel, and then they respond back with some, uh, well, how have we done this, you know, this little, what, us? We're so innocent. Uh, it's really, it's really a, a good challenge word, but working on that. But today, how can I change my life? How, you know, that's really a very common question, right? Uh, how can I change my life? If there was, do you have anything in your life that you would like to change? I have very few people, very few people have nothing in their life that they want to change. If you're one of those people, we might just give you a second to come on right down to the altar <laughs> right now because something's wrong with you. <laughs> you're delusional or, or you got a lot of pride or whatever. But yeah, there are very few people that have nothing in their life that they want to change. I mean, you know, an attitude or, or a habit or maybe even a temperament, you know. We all have physical stuff we want to change, right? Yeah, diets and so forth and up and down and all of that kind of stuff. We're always in the middle of something like that. And, you know, we, we read books and we go to seminars and we... Uh, get on YouTube and we watch videos and we Google things and we, and we, we get our friends to give suggestions. And we spend lots of money and lots of time uh, uh, trying to learn how to change. And maybe we do change for a while. But before you know it, here we are, back again, one more time, and nothing seems to last. Why is that? Why is it that nothing seems to last? I think it's because of our focus. I mean, look, we focus on the externals rather than the internals. We focus on the actions. God focuses on our attitudes. So for any lasting change to take place in our life, uh, we have to change on the inside. And if to change on the inside requires God's help. And, 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 and so we're going to look today at an Old Testament story. And I, I, I know I, there are lots of sermon series I've done that have messages about Jacob in it because Jacob is a very common character. You can almost look at Jacob for anything in life. What a rascal, you know. I mean, what, a, what, a, what, a, what, a, what an example of almost anything, good or bad, in life Jacob can be. But, but in, in this one story in Jacob's life, it's really one of the dominating stories of Jacob's life. Uh, Jacob has an experience with change. And once he has this experience with change, he's never the same again. From this point that we're about to read in just a moment, out of Genesis 32, from that point, from this passage we read, Jacob is never the same again. So what happened? He changed. What did God do to change Jacob that we could learn that maybe God would do in our lives and that we can cooperate with God and God could use so that our lives could change permanently for the better <laughs> uh, to, to what we desire in life and what we want to be in life. Well, let's just read the story and let's just see if we can kind of get a little go on this. And he arose, of course, that's Jacob, and he arose that night and he, and he took his two wives and two female servants and his 11 sons and he crossed over the ford of Jabbok, a little creek, a little, little brook called Jabbok. And he took them and he sent them over the brook and he sent over what he had. So he's waiting for his brother Esau to come and meet him because Esau has sent him a message that said, uh, I'm on my way, which wasn't good news for Jacob because the last time Esau saw Jacob, he said, I'm going to kill you because, you're, because Jacob swindled him out of his birthright. You remember this? You, this is coming in now, all right. Esau said, boy, don't let me catch you over here again because next time I see you, uh, you're dead. And so Jacob, remembering that, knowing that Esau has sent a message that not only is Esau on his way, but he's riding with 300 horsemen. Whew. 
Jacob has, you know, some flocks and, and some wives and some servants and, you know, some kids. I see bloodbath, massacre. So Jacob says, hmm, all right, I'm going to stay on this side of Jabbok and I'm going to send my wife and children on that side because that's the side Esau's coming up on. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, hey, he had to play every card, right? He said, man, if, if Esau sees my kids and, and my wife and, 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 and all that, maybe he'll have some compassion and won't kill me after all. So he sends him over. And that means he's left alone on the opposite side of Jabbok. And it's nighttime. And there are no parking lot lights. There are no Duracells. There are no anything. It's black dark. And all of a sudden... From up behind him, well, you'll see. Then Jacob, verse 24, was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And that word man is capitalized, and there's a good reason for that. Because this was far more than a man. Uh, it was just described as a man because it seemed like a man. As a matter of fact, the old Jewish rabbis looked at this man as Jacob's guardian angel. The old Jewish rabbis believe we all have a guardian angel. And the Bible tells us that God has dispatched his ables, uh, angels to protect the heirs of salvation. So pretty much the Bible says we do have angels that watch over us. And so just to show you how obnoxious and how, and how reprobate Jacob was, uh, even his guardian angel can't stand him and wants to beat him up. <laughs> but it probably wasn't his guardian angel because in just a few moments, Jacob himself is going to tell us something we need to know about who he's wrestling with. And I'll, I'll, I'll just wait. I know it won't be a surprise, but he's, he's in a full Nelson and he's wrestling and wrestling. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, now, it's a little confusing here, but... I'm going to read it the way it'll be, and you can see the way it is. It's, the pronouns are he and he and he and he and he. And you're going, he, who, he, who, which he is he, and he is he, Jacob, or is he the angel? So I'm going to read it like this. All right, now, when the angel saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, the angel touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as the angel wrestled with him. So in the middle of the wrestling match, the angel knocks... Well, as a matter of fact, uh, well, let me go ahead. And, and the angel says, let me go for the day breaks. Jacob's got a, got, a, got a hold on him. And he'd been wrestling all night. I mean, I can't imagine how tired. You know, you wrestle around for about 10 minutes. I probably couldn't wrestle five minutes. I'd be, I'd be yelling, toad frog, uncle, I give up or whatever. Man, I mean, that's, it's very, very tiring to wrestle, right? You know, but he's wrestling all, and Jacob's got a hold on him, and the angel said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So Jacob said, no, buddy, I'm not letting go of you until you bless me. So, he, so the angel said to him, what's your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. First time the name Israel is used in the scripture right there. Israel, which means wrestler with God, by the way. For you have struggled with God and with man, with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And the angel said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him. You know how he blessed him, right? Knocked his hip out of joint. <laughs> gave, him <a> limp. <laughs> gave him a limp for the rest of his life. Oh, what a blessing. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. And just to show you, I mean, I know people read this story, and they say, that's just an old wives' tale. That didn't happen that way. The Jews think it did. The whole nation honors it. Look at what it says. Therefore, to this day, 
the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. What an event in the life of, uh, of Jacob. Never the same again. Never same old Jacob going back to the same old things that he tried to change so many times in his life through all kinds of experiences with seeing angels coming down ladders from heaven and, and laying his head on a rock and tithing at Bethel. And, I mean, Jacob had all kinds of events in his, in his life. And here he is 40 years later, same old Jacob, same old con man, same old swindler, sending his wife and kids over ahead, hoping his brother won't kill him, still using his wit, still thinking like a lost man. God said, all right, buddy, we fix to have it out. This is the last night you're going to be old con man. Buddy, this, the fight is on. And, and, and so what can we see from this experience with Jacob? How, how would God change us? Your temper, your uh, thought pattern, your, uh, your life, your family, your relationships, uh, uh, your, your nature, your character, uh, the real you. How would God go about changing that? Well, let's look at this. There, there, there are four events, four parts of this event. Let's just look at them like phases. And so those of you that already have your notes that I wrote for you, let's look. Just, all right, fir first one. Phase, phase one. Let me get back. Phase one. Phase one, just right in your blank, is, is a crisis. A crisis. Jacob tells us, that he's wrestling with God. The Bible says, and the word and the verse says, that, that this was a man, and, and it's a capital man, as if uh, it's more than a man. And, and it's very clearly identified by Jacob himself and by the angel himself. When the angel looks at Jacob and says, you're no longer Jacob, but you're Israel, for you have wrestled with God and with man, and you have prevailed. And then Jacob says he named the place Peniel, which means I've seen God face to face, and my life has been preserved. And so who is Jacob wrestling with? He's wrestling with an Old Testament visitation of God to this earth. That's called an epiphany, by the way. And that's the same kind of thing that happened last week with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the midst of the fiery furnace. You remember when Nebuchadnezzar looked in, he said, how many did we put in? Three. Well, I see four of them in there, and one of them looks like the Son of God. Well, Jesus walking in the midst of the furnace, Jesus wrestling like an angel. And so Jacob is wrestling with God. Now, I don't know a lot about wrestling. I'm not MMA or any of that kind of stuff. I've never really... Uh, wrestled after I, uh, after I grew up and, and I'm, I wasn't a child. But, but as a child, I, I did some wrestling with my, with my other children friends. And, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, that the purpose of, uh, of wrestling is to bring someone to the point where they cry toad frog. Or uh, uh, maybe you said uncle. Or I give, I quit, you know, or maybe tap out, that's what the MMA guys do. I mean, the point of wrestling is to get somebody to the point where they say, I'm in a no-win situation, right? I can't win. I got to give up. I'm, I'm beat. I'm, I quit. Uh, you know, uh, you won. I see it like it is. Yeah, to, be, to, to submit, to be submissive. That's what a wrestling match is all about. But here we have Jacob wrestling with God all night long. <laughs> yeah, like that old, uh, oh, oh, what's his name out of, uh, I can't remember, but anyway, never mind. I forget about it. It's going through my mind. <laughs> oh, Lionel Richie, all night long. <laughs> oh, brain, you have to get the right cabinet. I, you know, I saw that. But he's wrestled all night long. And yet, here he is in the morning, and... Uh, and he's tired and he's worn out and, he, and, he's, and he's still hanging on. Which, wait, before I go any further in this, little, in, in, in this crisis thing, let me just ask you. Uh, what, what are you wrestling with this week? I mean, you wrestling with something this week? Maybe, maybe you've been wrestling for two weeks or three weeks. Maybe, 
Maybe it's been a long time you've been in a wrestling match and you're tired of it, right? And you're sick and tired. Matter of fact, you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, and, and you're in a no-win situation and, and, and it's a crisis and it's a problem and, it, and, it, and it's, it's a struggle for you. Have you stopped to think that maybe this crisis is God? Maybe God has you right where he wants you. Because I submit to you that God often uses crisis to get our attention. Sometimes it's the only way he can get to us. Why? Because as human beings, we are expert procrastinators. We are professional procrastinators, as a matter of fact, and we will dodge and dance around things as long as humanly possible. Our motto in life is uh, 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 maybe a little bit later or uh, uh, give me a little time. You know, I mean, it, it's like one of these days, one of these days, God, you know, we ought to have that tattooed on our chest. And we always plan to do something, but we never quite do it. A few years ago, well, it's been, been many years, Jim and I were talking out, out, in the, out in the cafe about this. Just made me remember. It. I used to wear, I don't know, none of you know this, probably Billy does, but none of you have ever seen me with cowboy boots on, right? Except Justin and uh, Tanya and Billy. Well, I used to wear them all the time. I mean, that's what I wore. I, I wore a suit, you know. I, I mean, I was preaching in regular, traditional, everything. A suit, all that, had on nice... Uh, um, Skin boots, uh, dress boots, uh, beautiful things, man. All kinds of exotic skins and stuff like that. I had a favorite pair, and I wore them, you know, quite often. And I wore a hole. They had a leather sole on them like that right there. And, if, and, and I wore a hole right about in the middle of them, right in the middle of one of those soles. And we ha used to have to sit up on the podium, to, you know, before church. If you've ever been in a more traditional situation than us, the pastors sit up on the stage, on the podium, you know, in, in holiness until it's time to get up and preach and stuff and make the announcements and all that kind of stuff. Well, I had to be sure that I didn't cross my legs and show my hole on in my boot. Or kind of lean back and let my feet come up off the ground and you could see the hole in my boot. Look, look at that poor fellow. He can't even afford a shoe. And I lived with that hole, saying all the time, you know, I'm, I need to get this thing fixed. I need, uh, hey, tomorrow I'm taking this to the shop. We're going to get these new soles put up, blah, blah, blah. You know when I put some new soles on there? After it rained about a week, and I spent three, I spent three days with soggy socks. After that, I, 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 I went and got them fixed. Now, look, I... That's a silly crisis, and that's just a really, you know, goofy little funny kind of crisis, but I hope it makes the point. Uh, your crisis may not be a little funny, something like that. Your crisis might be something deadly serious or something extremely painful in life, but, but, but I'm just saying that, that the sad reality of human nature is that we never change until the pain that we experience exceeds our fear of change in our life. As long as we can be comfortable back here and it's not too painful and it's not too drastic and it's not causing us all that many problems, to change is fearful. I mean, what, what is it going to be like? And are people going to accept it? I mean, am I going to make it? Can I do it? Uh, is it going to be a problem? I mean, man, the fear of change is a drastic fear in life, and we never change until our pain gets greater than our fear of change. And I'm just saying that many of the crises that God brings us to in life cause us pain that is greater than our fear of changing in life, and we desperately need to change, and God knows it, and Jacob wrestled all night long and finally came to the knowledge that he had to change in his life. And he grabs onto that angel and he says, I'm not letting you go. Which brings us to our second phase. The second phase is commitment. Oh yeah, they'll all be cute little C's, you know. Yeah, we love alliterations, right? Now, I want you to notice 
there's an interesting reaction to this all-night wrestling match. Um, Jacob is wrestling. He goes through all that he goes through. And, and the angel says, let me go. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Jacob is basically saying to God, now follow this. I mean, think about this. Hey, I'm staying with this struggle. I'm not letting go of this struggle. I, 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 I need to benefit from this. Look, I put too much time into this. I've wrestled all night long. I, I, I've put too much uh, uh, of myself into this. Uh, maybe you would be saying, I've spent too much money. I've taken too much time. Maybe it's a relationship. I mean, think of that. I mean, everybody that's in this church that's in a relationship, I guarantee you, you have invested in that relationship. The longer you've been in the relationship, the more you've invested in that relationship. You've changed things. You've dealt with things. You've compromised on things. You've led things. You've backed off of things. You've put money. you put time. you put effort. you put everything you have into that relationship. And when it gets ragged, you just basically say, I'm not letting it go. I've got too much invested in this thing to just let it go. And that's what Jacob was saying to God. He said, look, I've got too much time, effort, and energy to let this thing go uh, 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 until I get the good out of it. I mean, there's, there's a blessing in this thing. I know there's something good, and I'm determined to stick with it and hold on until I get some of the good out of it. So here's the fact. God often uses crisis to bring us to the point of change. But then, even when he does get our attention, he doesn't automatically stop the battle. Why? Why didn't God, when, when he finally gets our attention and the wrestling match has been successful? Okay, God, I cry, Uncle, tap, ah, you know, you got me. I'm in a no-win situation. I surely need to change. God, uh, all right, then why didn't God let him up? Why does it go on? Because God never wastes a crisis. Now, you thought one of the political parties thought of that, right? Never waste a good crisis? That came from God. It's what he's been doing all through eternity. Never waste a good crisis. Get all you can out of it. Well, let's, let me ask you, do you want God to waste crisis? the crisis that you're in right now, would you like to get out of it only to come back into it later on? No. God, while we're here, get all of it that's here. I mean, seriously. There are lots of things that we need to learn. Lots of things we need to mature in. Lots of attitudes that need to be changed. Lots of thought patterns that need to be altered. Prejudices that need to be stricken down. Objects in our lives that we need to see the reality of. Man, look, God takes us into crisis many times, and he just stays right in that crisis until, we, until he, just, he just drips every drip of gospel honey out of that thing that can be dripped out of it. How serious are you? How bad? How, would it be how badly do you want it? How bad do you want it? How much do you want it? <laughs> That's something you need to know. Something God wants you to see. God, I'm desperate about this. God, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm serious about this. I, 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 I'm, I, this is it for me, God. I'm desperately serious about this thing. And God said, are you sure? And we're at the point of crisis and God is ringing it. Because as human beings, you know what our first response to crisis is? To run. To get out of there, man. No, God, no. You know, that's our first response to it. I am, I am convinced that many people miss God's best simply because they give up too soon. I'm telling you, the answer may be right around the corner. And, you, and you're saying, Uncle, you're giving it up. Look, 
this is what Paul says in Galatians 6. Let, and let us not grow weary while doing good. You, you older, the King James Version, let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we don't give up. But we give up. And why do we give up? Because we're not committed. We want the easy way. Oh, we're willing to take it, God, if you'll give it to us. We're willing to take it if, if we don't have to struggle too much with this or worry about it or take some of our precious time away from watching the ball game on Sunday afternoon. Sorry, I didn't mean to meddle in that. We don't have to worry about it anymore because our saints lost them. We can preach about ball games now all we want to. But you see, commitment. Am I committed? Here's a, here's a crisis, and here's a wrestling match, and here's God, you know, even when the wrestling match is over, uh, whew, God doesn't let me up. He keeps ringing it out, ringing it out, ringing it out. He won't let me go. Jacob says, I'm committed to this struggle, and I'm not giving up, God, until, God, you turn this burden into a blessing. So phase one is a crisis. It might be God. You've been all sad and down in the dumps because you, know, you thought it was your job or you thought it was your boss or you thought it was your kids or you thought it was, was the circumstances or your paycheck or your community or that angry person that lives next door. No, 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 no. Oh, it's God. God's brought you to a crisis. And now he's asking, how committed are you? How serious are you about this? You gonna give up quick? Are you coming on? Well, which leads us, uh, Jacob said, I'm not giving up. I'm, you know, I'm not, you, you're gonna have to bless me or kill me one or something because I'm not letting go. And then it brings us to the third phase, which is confession. Now I know that little, when you write confession down, that doesn't sound like it really means anything, but it really does. Because this angel asked Jacob something in the middle of this wrestling match. And it seems so weird. I'm sure God put this in here so we would say, that's weird. And then we would say, why did he put that in there? Because the angel looks at Jacob. He's been wrestling with him all night long. And he looks at him and he says, what is your name? Like, yeah, like he didn't know, bro. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you think that, 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 that the angels of God are, are the Old Testament incarnation of Christ? Do you think they just walk around over the earth looking around and they see somebody over there, a stranger, and they go, you know, I think I'm going to go over there and I'm going to whip that stranger. <laughs> right. No. You know he knew who he was wrestling with. You know he knew his name. So why do you ask him, what is your name? Because a name in the Old Testament was more than just what they called you. A name in the Old Testament was a reflection of your character, who you really were. So this angel says, what's your name? And he said, swindler, heel grabber, con man. Now just turn around on the other foot. Let's suppose if somebody, if somebody called you now by your character, what name would they have for you? Hey, lazy, get over here. <laughs> Lust town, quit doing that back there. Thief, get away from over there. Tailbearer, stop doing that. What God was asking for was a confession for Jacob to confess who he was. Because every time the name Jacob was confessed, it was a confession of all that Jacob was and a reminder of all of the people that Jacob had swindled and conned and manipulated and taken advantage of in life. And God made him face himself. Look, we are not going to change until we are at least able to admit and confess our weaknesses. You're not going to change them if you don't even know what they are or you won't admit what they are. 
You confess. What does confess them to who? Or is it to whom? To whom? <laughs> Tanya's my resident English major. <laughs> Everybody needs one, don't you? <laughs> confess it to whom? To God. And let me tell you something. When you confess it to God, he's not going to be sitting up in heaven going, you are kidding me. Wow, you? I, man, I'm so shocked. No, God knows you. He sees you. He knows everything about you. And he's not going to be... I mean, God, look, God has come to be your friend not your enemy. He didn't come to destroy you. He came to save you. And so you confess it to God and you confess it to yourself. Admit it to you. And, I, I, and, and many times I would say, I would say, and I'm, and I'm putting a, uh, I'm putting a, I'm putting a, uh, oh, what, what am I putting on it, Tanya? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting, a, I'm putting a, a, some circumstances. I, I, there's a word for it to slip my old crazy mind. A disclaimer. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. A disclaimer. I couldn't think of it. All right. I'm going to put this disclaimer on it. Do not tell some innocent person all of your wicked sin. You know, like your wife or somebody. Or your kids. Or, I mean, don't... Because... You don't, they don't need to hear all that. Find somebody else. Find somebody like me or somebody that is a mature Christian that knows you and you can, if you need to confess something to somebody that'll hold you accountable. That's the only reason you would need to is that they would know you and they would see you and they would say, oh, hey, wait a minute. You made that commitment, didn't you? No, we can't do that anymore. But you need, at least need to confess it to God and, 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 and to yourself, and, 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 and when, when you come to God and you confess uh, your weakness, he's going to take that and, and it becomes, it becomes a, a tool that God can use in your life. And so phase three is when we come face to face with ourselves. And he, he asked the angel his name and the angel said, don't worry about my name. And he blessed him and then, and then Jacob started thinking about what had happened, and he, he gave the place a name. And the name of the place was Peniel, which means the face of God. Now, I'm not sure I would have named it Peniel. I, I, I think I probably would have named it <laughs> Much less God. And God wants to be, like I said, he's, he, he's not trying to be your enemy. He wants to be your friend. I mean, he, he didn't come to scare us. He came to save us. And what will God do for me when I cooperate with God? Well, he changed Jacob's name, which reflects a change. God changed his character. God changed his nature. He used to be swindler and cheater, and now he's Israel and, and prince with God. He used to be a crook, and now he's a prince. And then he changed his walk because he used to be able to run away. <laughs> and now he limps on an old bad hip and he can't run anymore. But what a blessing. What a blessing. I mean, imagine this. Here he is on Jabbok. He's wrestled all night with the angel. His kids and all of his children and his wife and all of them, they're on the other side. Sun's coming up in the morning. Here comes Jacob down to Jabbok. He's tripping along, hair's all disheveled, clothes half torn off, face all muddy and smutty and messed up, limping like this right here. One of his boys over there says, Man, who is that? And then one of them said, Dad? Is that you? He said, yeah, boy, it's me. And, and he said, and as he, as he tromped down through the creek, you know, shh, shh, the boy said, Dad, what happened to you? And he looks at him and he said, I got blessed. I got blessed. 
<laughs> and you say, well, he, might, he doesn't look like any blessed person I've ever seen. They never do. Blessed people never look like that, like, like they're blessed. Because blessed people have been in with God, and there's going to be a limp somewhere. I'm going to tell you that. Where God has dealt with you, and you no longer can run from him anymore. And so the blessing here is that Jacob walks away from this wrestling match with the strength of an angel and the limp of a helpless man. And that's our life. How, does, how, do, we, how do I change my life? I cooperate with the crisis. I commit myself to the, to the, to the crisis that God would use come face to face with myself and come clean with God. And God changes my life. Listen, from this point right here, from that point right there, Jacob was never the same again. For 40 years in your Bible, read his story. He made these little deals with God and he did all these little things with God and he was the same old Jacob. After 40 years, the same old swindling con man until he wrestled with God. God said, put him in a half Nelson and said, boy, me and you having it out right now. You are not walking away from this like you walked into this. I'm so tired of you walking around spouting around, God's so good, God, that's my life, and you hadn't changed. Boy, let's go. And there was a wrestling match with God. Any change. All right. Would you bow your head with me, please?